Hi guys, welcome to another Monday Night Study. Tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, Testament of Enos. And I want to give you a little bit of background to it and uh, some of the history of who he is, what was going on in his time period, and then um, uh, what his actual testament says. So let me just check my settings, make sure we're doing okay here. Okay. Um, let's start off by looking at who he was. So well, this, this should be really interesting. This is one of the smallest and yet one of the oldest of the Testaments. So let's see here. This is Genesis chapter 5. And let's just read this here. It says, um, this is the descendants of, of Adam to Noah. So if we go to verse 3 here, it says that Adam, we know Adam was created in the Garden of Eden, or was created and then put in the Garden of Eden. It says Adam lived 135 years, or 130 years rather, and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image and called his name Seth. So Adam was created, from the day he was created, he was in his 130th year when his son was born, Seth. Now he had Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Cain was banished. And then he had Seth. So we're going through the basic lineage that gets us up to Messiah. And then um, all the days of Adam was uh, 930. Now look at verse 6 here. It says, Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Okay, so Enos was the person we're talking about is Adam's grandson. So Adam, Seth, and Enos. So if you take the 105 years and add it to the 130 years, he was born 235 years after creation. So it's in the ancient Hebrew year 235 AM, which is Anna Monday. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what we've got here, and it goes on and talks about other things. So in his days, uh, again, the, the concept of the Testaments is that Adam, through Aaron, uh, wrote Testaments to their kids. So we have a very small quote of Adam's Testament from Josephus, and that's about it, and nothing from Seth that I know of. Uh, it exists, of course, somewhere, but we don't have it at the moment. So the next one would be Enos. So at this point, we know who Enos is. So we have... Adam, Seth, Enoth, Canaan, uh, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, and on down to Noah. So the, the ten patriarchs pre-flood. So let's take this for a second. We'll go ahead and go over to uh, look at some more history of it. If we go to the book of Jasher, and this is our uh, PDF version of the one that you guys probably have uh, that we put together a ways back. If we go down to... Uh, Seth to Enoch, which is chapter 2. Uh, this is the section here about Cain and Abel being killed and then Enos. So we're going to read this part right here. So this would be 2.35 a.m., so when, when he was born. So this is what uh, Jasher says about him and that particular time period. And Seth lived uh, 105 years and begot a son... And Seth called the name of his son Enosh, uh, Enosh or Enos. It's pronounced or, or written a couple of different ways depending on what Bible you're using. Uh, because in the time the sons of men began to multiply and to afflict their souls and their hearts by transgressing and rebelling against God. It was in the days of Enosh that the sons of men continued to rebel and transgress against God to increase the anger of the Lord against the sons of men. The sons of men went and they took and served other gods, and they forgot the Lord that created them in the earth. And in those days the sons of men made images of brass, iron, wood, and stone. They bowed down to them and served them. So this is when the very first idolatry uh, began. Every man made his own God, and they bowed down to them. The sons of men forsook the Lord all the days of Enos and his children. The anger of the Lord was kindled on account of their works and the abominations which they did in the earth. 
the Lord caused the waters of the river Gihon to overwhelm them, and he destroyed and consumed them. So this was a very small flood. Uh, again, it's a type of warning. The, the floods that come, the earthquakes, those kind of things, it's a judgment of God. Um, he destroyed a third part of the earth, notwithstanding this, the sons of men did not turn from their evil ways. Now, we don't know how big uh, the earth was at the time or how many people on it. So a third of the population of the center of wherever this evil was going on. Now, later on, they won't repent. He'll send a flood and it will destroy the entire planet. And it goes on and says that the sons of men did not turn from their evil ways. Their hands were yet extended to do evil in the sight of the Lord. In those days there was neither sowing nor reaping in the earth, and there was no food for the sons of men, and a famine was very great in those days. So the Lord sent a flood to destroy things, and then he sent a famine, different ways to try to get you to wake up. Um, and of course, they probably blamed it on natural occurrences. Uh, the seed which they sowed in those days in the ground became thorns, thistles, and briars. From the days of Adam was this declaration concerning the earth of the curse of God, which he cursed the earth on account of the sin which Adam sinned before the Lord. And we know that from Genesis. And it was when men continued to rebel and transgress against God and to corrupt their ways that the earth also became corrupt. And then it says Enos lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And there's some really interesting stories about Canaan on there. So just looking at this, we go back to it again. Enos was the grandson of Adam, and he was holy. Uh, he, so it was Adam, Seth, and then Enos. During his days, people got really, really corrupt. There's a really good apostasy, a really bad apostasy forming. Um, idolatry became rampant. They did things to anger the Lord. The Lord sent um, a flood and a famine and other things to try to get their attention, and they wouldn't pay any attention. Now, if we go ahead and finish reading Jasher, what we see is in the days of Canaan on up there, he was able to lead a small revival. So Adam loses control. Seth is not able to do much with it. In the days of Enos, it got really bad. Enos wasn't able to do a whole lot with it. But Canaan was able to effect a small revival. He was very short-lived. And then it goes on down the line. E and then when Enoch comes along, he's able to make a major revival. But it doesn't last very long either. And as we know, eventually the world was destroyed with a flood. So that's what's happening in Enos's days. Now, from the concept of the patriarchs, we know that Adam, all the way through Aaron, understood Bible prophecy, or there's no Bible yet, but Messianic prophecy, that there would be a person born of their lineage, that would save mankind somehow. And as time went on, more and more light gathered. They understood more and more prophecies. Now we know that Adam predicted that, uh, this is the quote from Josephus, Adam predicted that the world would be destroyed once by a flood of water and once by a torrent of fire. But he didn't know which one would come first. And so it's interesting to kind of see that. So this is what's going on in his days. Now with that, let's go ahead and look at the testament of Enos, what's left of it, and see what's going on. So Adam should have written one, and Seth, and Enos, but we just have, other than the quote of Adam, we just have uh, that particular one. So now here is the testaments of the patriarchs we put together a few years ago. These are all the collection of the patriarchal writings that we can get our hands on uh, as of a year or two ago and uh, put them together because this is um, the basic understanding of doctrine and righteousness, holiness, and prophecy from the Essenes. The Essenes, uh, the school of the prophets there at Qumran, writers of the dead, keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, would say that they understand the Old Testament by the um, way the patriarchs explained it. Now, later on, you're going to have Pharisees that say, this stuff is all garbage. There was real patriarchal writings, but you guys have made this stuff up. It's not real. And we know this because we go by the Talmud or the traditions of, the, of our ancestors. Now, in the days of Jesus, if you're a Christian like me, you'll hold the New Testament as being the supreme 
uh, understanding of everything. So Jesus said, the Pharisees make void the word of God by their traditions. He called it the traditions of the elders, specifically the Pharisee branch. Now, this is the stuff that's going to say there is no Messiah. The Messiah, when he comes, if he comes, will be just a man. There's no virgin birth, etc. And the patriarchal writings say the exact opposite. So, as a Christian, I'm going to say whatever the New Testament says is my theology. And if you take the New Testament theology, the way the New Testament interprets the Old, back in that time period and compare it to the teachings of the Essenes, the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the other subgroups, it matches perfectly with Essene doctrine and does not match anybody else. So the Essenes basically are our brothers. So we'll go through and look at some of these things, um, and we'll, we'll see how they go. But now here's the Testament of the Patriarchs. So let's just take a look at this. Again, you're supposed to have uh, a lot of these, but we have the Testament of Enos, which is this one here. And that's the only one, or the, the oldest one that we have. And then the Testament of Lamech, which was Noah's father. We have a fragment of that. And then the Testament of Noah. If any of you guys know um, um, Avi Lipkin, who is trying to get the Christian, the Bible block party going in Israel um, for their safety as well as ours. His son does a lot of archaeology and things like that. And uh, Aaron uh, is very favorable of the Testament of Noah. It's really neat for them to know that they dug up these testaments themselves, and that proves that the Jews are in their land. It's their land. Uh, they just need to read the testaments and see exactly what they say. Then we have part of the Testament of Abraham, part of the Testament of Jacob, and then Jacob's 12, 12 kids. So we've got Reuben down through Benjamin. Okay, and then Levi becomes the priest. So this one here. So Levi would hand all of these books down to his son, which is Kohath. So Kohath hands it down to Amram. Amram uh, is his son is two sons are Moses and Aaron. Moses becomes the lawgiver and begins writing the Old Testament as we know it, starting with Genesis. Uh, the Testament of Aaron, though, is Amram. So all of these extra biblical writings, the patriarchal stuff, is handed down from father to son, all the way down to Aaron. And Aaron makes mention of these things in his testament. And so that's where this kind of stuff stops. At this point, then, that's like the pre-canon instructions. And then we have Moses writing what begins to be the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is sealed in the time of Ezra. And then we have the intertestimonial period, which is the rest of the histories in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, then we have, coming on the scene, the actual Messiah. And so we have the, the four Gospels, the Book of Acts, and then it goes on with the others. And then the New Testament is closed. So we don't want to confuse these and say these things need to be added to either one of the two testaments or anything. It's a separate work by itself, uh, not to be considered on par with Scripture, but to help understand uh, that kind of a thing. So let's go for a second. And then at the end of this, we have a prophecy outline, and there's several prophetic things that we pull from all these things. A lot of really interesting morality, prophecy, and other things. So if we go to the Testament of Enos, Here's, here's it, and it's very, very fragmented, very small. So we're going to be done really quick on this. But um, it's, um, it's called 4Q369. And what this means is in Qumran, the Qumran area, there are several caves. And some caves are empty. They don't have anything in them. Others had scrolls in them. So the fourth cave in Qumran that had any kind of scrolls at all, is what this came from. So if you went to cave four in Qumran, Qumran is the Q, four is the cave. This is the 369th scroll or fragment of a scroll that they pulled out. And that's just the way they, they label them so you can quickly go back. So what is the scroll? 4Q369. <clears throat> well, we're going to see here that it's part of the Testament of Enos. So this is what it says, and it starts off fragmented, of course. All the mysteries, whatever that is, okay? Uh, and he goes on and says, The angel of peace will, then it's fragmented at the end, until the guilty repent. So there is a concept of repentance, 
um, the concept of repentance is to turn from your, your sins and stop doing what you're doing, not just say, I'm sorry. Uh, but still, if you've, you're guilty of something, you need to um, not only repent, but you have to somehow, somebody somehow has to pay for those sins. And we can't do it because we are sinners. So the Messiah has to come. And again, this is talked about from Adam all the way down. So that concept is in there. Then it talks about all of the festivals in their periods, because from old you have engraved your marvelous something. So this is probably him giving a, a praise to God uh, about the teachings that are engraved or written, that kind of thing. But notice the festivals in their periods. So we're talking about the concept of the Moedim, uh, which are the seven, we know them as seven festivals of Leviticus, and there's actually more than seven festivals. But these festivals are, they're called Moedim in Hebrew, and they basically mean that something happens on that date and or uh, the ritual done on that date means something. So you can kind of think of it, 4th of July is coming up. On the 4th of July, there was an incredible event that occurred. It's the birth of our nation, you know, and we celebrate it as such. So we celebrate and remember the things that happened on the date of which they happened. Well, Moedim are prophetic and they kind of the opposite. Sometimes the parts of the Moedim festivals will talk about or teach on things that happened in the past. Other times they talk about things that happen in the future. And so many times it's both. So a Moedim or a festival then is prophetic. So they have the concept back then of certain dates, certain things happen sometime in the future. And it also rem reminds us or we have a memory or a, a memorial of something that happened way back when. So, so far from the Enos, we understand that there are mysteries. The guilty need to repent. Someone needs to pay for the repentance. That's what the Messiah does. And there are certain festivals involved in these prophecies. So the Messiah will come and die for our sins, or at this point they may not even know he dies, but he does something to fix the sin nature. And that event apparently falls on one of the festivals. And now looking back at it from our time, we know it was Passover. Okay, it goes on and says, His judgment, something, until the ordained time of judgment, as recorded in the eternal commands. So there's going to be some sort of judgment day, and it is ordained, and so that means it's set in stone, so to speak. So we may not know when judgment day is, but it's a specific day. So in other words, you probably couldn't pray that it hurry up and come or to extend it, you know, hundreds of years out in the future. It, there's a day set, and judgment is going to come to that. It's been that way from eternal times. He would have learned this from Seth and or Adam. Now, I just find that amazing, or some d direct revelation from God. So, now look at this. This is how we know it's the testament of Enos. My son, Canaan was the fourth generation. Mahaliel, his son, was the fifth generation. Jared, his son, was the sixth generation. Enoch, his son, was the seventh generation. And then it's fragmented again. That's that first fragment or column. So, we understand that it's Adam... Seth, uh, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel. And so if it says Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, and then Enoch being the seventh from Adam, we, we all know that. If Canaan is his son, and he's the fourth generation, this is Enos who's writing this. So this is an, an amazing uh, Dead Sea Scroll. So from Fragment 1, we know that the festivals, the Noadin, are understood. They're prophetic. We need to repent of our sins. Messiah somehow has to fix our sin nature. And some of these things, most of these are mysteries to them still. Okay, now we get to fragment two, or fragment one still, the column number two. And we'll read this one. And this is a little bit better, a little nice big piece that's not so messed up. You have divided your name for his inheritance so that he may establish your name there. She, and later on in this, we can figure out it's, it's the holy city we're talking about. So that could be Jerusalem, 
or it could be the New Jerusalem. There's actually Dead Sea Scrolls that describe the New Jerusalem as it comes down in the next age, which is really interesting because if you take that description and you compare it to the book of Revelation, uh, when it talks about the New Jerusalem, um, the descriptions are identical. Now, you know, John wrote the book of Revelation, no matter how you argue the time, it's in the first century. It's not before Christ. It's in the first century or further up. These things are all first century or further back BC. So this is giving the same description of what John saw in the book of Revelation in the vision as a vision. So it's, it's interesting how they all have the same thing. This doesn't, but there is a Dead Sea Scroll called the New Jerusalem that describes it. So anyway, so uh, the holy city is the glory of your earthly kingdom. So that's probably Jerusalem we're talking about. Um, and there's enough evidence to assume that Jerusalem was a capital, uh, a place where God had um, uh, a temple, uh, an altar, things like that, pre-flood. Now the entire pre-flood world was wiped out. And then after the flood, these things were put back together. Now Shem and Eber wind up going to the area of Jerusalem and staying there, forming the, the yeshiva of, of Shem and Eber, uh, which taught all the prophecies from that time period. So it makes sense that they would just not pick a random spot. Uh, they probably knew the prophecies connected with that area, but there's some evidence to suggest that anciently pre-flood there was a holy city too and this is just one of those things that lets you kind of pull that together so i'm speculating a bit now but just trying to figure out exactly what he's talking about so if the holy city is the glory of god's earthly kingdom uh in the time of of moses it and and forward it would definitely be jerusalem so jerusalem's been the eternal capital for a long time but it goes back so you will eternally watch over her and your glory will manifest there. So you may not know exactly what we're talking about or the full ramifications of his glory, but definitely the Messiah comes there and dies for our sins. The second coming occurs and in the millennial reign, he will rule from Jerusalem. So we're definitely talking at this point about the city of Jerusalem. We know this hindsight. Uh, and they probably knew it also because of what was pre-flood. She will be an eternal passion throughout all generations of her to his seed. Now, this is interesting, too. So Jerusalem will be an eternal passion, a, a holy place for the Jews from the time it starts or way back when until his seed comes. And so we're probably talking about Messiah. Messiah came, died for our sins. Jerusalem was somewhat destroyed, Temple Mount and stuff, and then desolate for a long, long num number of years. By your righteous judgment, you will purify him to be an eternal light. I'm not sure who we're talking about here. You have made him a firstborn son to you. Could be Messiah, could be Abraham, or one of the others that, you know, father the nation. You have made him a firstborn son to you. He will be a prince and ruler of your earthly kingdom. Again, could be Abraham, could be a lot of things. You have placed a crown of the heavens and glory and clouds upon him. That sounds like Messiah. You have placed the angel of your peace in his congregation and given him laws of righteousness as a father does for his son. This could also be talking about Enoch, because Enoch walked with the angels pre-flood. So in either case, we're talking about, again, walking with the angels, walking in the light of prophecy, and those things. He loves you, and he has your spirit. Through them, you establish your glory. So God establishes his glory through us when we um, love him and his spirit rests upon us. So you need, you need to be saved. You need to be a Christian. You need to have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And we see that in many, many other places. Okay, so let's go down here. These get really iffy because they're very, very small. 
So fragment two says something about prison. Okay. Angels intercede and to fight against all lands. That kind of reminds me of, um, I think it's Daniel chapter, tel, uh, chapter 10, 8 or 10, when it talks about the um, prince of Greece, the prince of Persia, and it sounds like there is a demonic or angelic power that governs those lands. And it's not so much that Persia is fighting with Greece as it is in the spiritual realm, angels fighting or something like that. And we see that kind of a thing taught clearly in other scrolls. So that's probably what we're talking about. You judge and recompense them for their works. And that's actually mentioned too in that same comment that the uh, angels that don't keep their first estate, the ones that battle for the Lord, will eventually be judged and punished. Fragment 3 says, you rule all that is, so God is in control of everything. You give honor to whom you will. You hold all denomination or dominions rather in your hand and call each one by name. So this dominion most likely is like all the different kingdoms of the world, all the different Gentile kingdoms. They have a time to begin, a time to live, and a time to die, a time to be taken over or dissipate or whatever, uh, the different kingdoms, the different empires. It could also be talking about the dominions of the angels that rule over those empires or both. And call each one by name. He understands and knows everything. That just gives me a lot of comfort to know that God's in control and he allows certain things for a purpose. And whatever that purpose is, I want it also. So I want him to have his will. Because even though it may not seem good, it's got to be for the best. So, okay, next one here. Times of dominion. Generations and appointed times. So again, we're going back to that concept. Appointed times is another reference to Moedim. So something about prophecy, certain generations and certain dominions come and go, and God's in control of it. So in fragment five, we included in there to be thorough, without you, who knows what we're talking about. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Now let me just, I'll just read briefly here the commentary I put in the book, trying to pull all that together. Um, fra fragment 1, column run, is classified as the Testament of Enos, partially because he begins his chronology with his son Canaan. So that makes it obvious it's Enos's uh, testament rather than someone else's. Basically, pulling all this together, God is sovereign, and he's made unchangeable decrees that include true law and repentance, which is teshuva, festivals for signs, and a future time of judgment. So again, we're getting all this from those fragments. It would be really nice to have the whole testament. Most of you know how big the Book of Enoch is. The Book of Enoch is Enoch's testament. And it looks like it's been added to, slightly garbled, the, the big version that we have. And looking at the Dead Sea Scroll fragments, they agree almost word perfect with the one that we have. But there's also extra information in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, specifically, some of those helped us discover how the calendar works. So, the pre-flood calendar. So, really interesting in that. Um, fragment 2 seems to teach the capital of the pre-flood uh, city or that would be rebuilt afterwards and become the center for God's glory again. And of course this was first called Salem. Later it was renamed Jerusalem. Um, then it describes either Abraham who followed, fathered the nation of Israel or the Messiah who came from the nation to bring salvation or both. And the way the prophets go, they kind of go back and forth. Um, remember if you're looking at it from their time period, the first thing that you want is righteousness. The second thing is you want whoever the guy that is that gets called to start the nation uh, that would be called Israel. You may not know that's its name, but there's supposed to be a nation with special laws and covenants and things, and the Messiah comes through them. So until they start up, we can't really have a Messiah. So we want that to hurry up. Much like we want the kingdom to come, but before that there has to be a tribulation period. And before that we have to have a rapture. So we're kind of wanting that rapture to hurry up and come. So same kind of a thing there. 
Um, Fragment 2 seems to be stating that there's angels over, over countries that fight for control of those countries. God judges each situation, punishing some and forgiving others. And then fragments 3 to 5 are really too small to make anything out of. They seem to indicate that God is in control. He's decreed, again, certain ages with certain powers to rule. But ultimately, God is always in control, and evil will be judged on the day of judgment. There's also a mention of Moedim or appointed times. So really interesting with that. Uh, let's see here. So that's the, the entire testament. So I just wanted to do this as a small study. Uh, it's been about a half an hour. But again, the concept is really cool if you think about it. The Essenes said, we believe these testaments are real. If this is what Adam said at Enos and Canaan and Enoch and these guys, if they're real, we need to pay attention to them. They walked with God. Now, if the theology they teach is that there's one Messiah with two comings, the Messiah comes first at the end of the age of grace, or the end of the age of Torah, and begins the age of grace, and they give you the exact date on which that's supposed to happen, and that turn on our calendar turns out to be 32 AD. And then they talk about how the Mel Melchizedekian uh, order begins again with Messiah, and at the end of the age of grace, there's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. There's going to be a time of trouble. There's going to be this establishment of a millennial kingdom. And it's really, really amazing. The concept is that the they were dispensationalists. So the age of chaos or the age of creation was the first age coming from creation and going to the call of Abraham when he was 52. Uh, that's what they say. And if you go back and you look at that, that would have been exactly 2000 AM. And then from Abraham's call to the first coming of the Messiah, which happens right before the end of that particular age, 2000 year age, uh, takes place. And of course, Messiah came and this is what's amazing because this is why you can't pin you can pinpoint some dates but not others. The whole concept that Messiah was born around 2 BC, uh, he died around 32. You know, I'm not arguing dates, but basically there. Uh, the very next Pentecost after he died is the Pentecost ushering us into the Age of Grace. In other words, the birth of the Church Age. Then 70 AD was the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Uh, 73 was the shutdown of the Essene temple, in, which is a Jewish temple in uh, Alexandria, Egypt, which is part of another se series of prophecies. And then 75 was the end of the age. But then you had a rebellion, and the Bar Kokhba rebellion began at about 130-ish, and by 135 it was crushed and Israel ceased to exist. And there's a whole lot of history that the Dead Sea Scrolls teach on that time period. But again, around the turn of an age, you've got 100 to 150 years before and after that all sorts of things happen, miracles, things like that. So the end of our age is approaching, and we've seen Israel come back as a nation, take back the Temple Mount. Both those dates were prophesied, and the actual dates on when it would occur are actually prophesied, and did come to pass correctly. We've seen all sorts of things like the uh, getting ready for the temple, the uh, Sanhedrin coming back, the priesthood coming back, the high priest. We've uh, seen the practice sacrifices starting in 2014, uh, the things that Trump has done to speed up the process, all sorts of things uh, that are clues that we're getting toward the end of our time period. So the rapture could be around the corner at any time. So, okay, let's go ahead. We'll stop this now. I just wanted to share that with you. So this has been the Testament of uh, Enos.